In this series, I've built a ZX Spectrum which still uses a Z80 CPU, but it doesn't need one of the infamous uncommitted logic array chips. Instead, the raster generator is a simple finite state machine using an EEPROM. In this video and the next, I'm going to go over the schematic diagram for the machine and the code used to generate the EEPROM. These are available on GitHub, so you might want to download them and look at your own local copy while I go over the details. Before I do though, I just want to look at the jail bars again from the last video. Now, these were occurring for low intensity colours, but not high intensity colours. As was mentioned in the comments, this is probably because the high intensity colours saturate the 0.7 volt threshold for white in VGA, and the noise is occurring above the threshold. I went back and did the calculations for the resistor network I used, and this is indeed the case. There were many helpful suggestions in the comments, but the first thing that worried me was the distance between the 74HC374 driving these signals and the VGA port itself. These unprotected wires were about 10 centimeters or 4 inches long, and they went over some high-speed logic. Initially, I was going to shield these wires, but then I noticed I had some spare space in the top left-hand corner of the board. So, I added in a 74HC174, which is a hex D type flip-flop chip. This reduced the distance travelled by the video signals to about 1 to 2 centimetres. This significantly improved the jail bars. They're still there, but they're far less noticeable. I may try and tackle this again later, but for now they're okay. Let's start looking at the schematic diagram. The source of the raw clock is this 28 megahertz oscillator can. I'm actually using a 28.363 MHz oscillator for now, because I'm still waiting for some 28 MHz ones to arrive from China. I can use 28.636 MHz, I just need to make some adjustments in the raster generator. These oscillators are pretty easy to use. You provide power, ground, and you get an accurate 28 MHz square wave out of pin 8. Now, 28 MHz divided by 8 is 3.5 MHz, which is the CPU clock the ZX Spectrum uses. To generate the clock signals I need, I'm using this 74HC161 up counter. This divides down the raw clock signal to generate a 14 MHz signal, a 7 MHz signal, a 3.5 MHz signal, and a 1.75 MHz signal. That's all good and well, but the main reason I chose this particular chip is that it has a terminal count out signal. This is meant to be used to cascade or group together these counters to form a larger counter. It means that in a larger counter, all the outputs transition on the clock signal rather than acting as a ripple counter. This TC out signal is high when the count reaches 15, but it's low otherwise. If I use the 14 MHz signal for the dot clock, then the terminal count out signal will be high for the last half of every eighth pixel. This is exactly the signal I need for loading pixel data into the shift register in the video circuit. The only problem is that the load signal on the 74HC166 is active low, so I need to invert the terminal count signal before sending it out. The second output is the 7 MHz signal. I don't actually use this. Next is 3.5 MHz. This is the CPU clock, and I need both this signal and its inverse. After that is 1.75 MHz. Again, I need this signal and its inverse for selecting between pixel fetches and attribute fetches from main memory. One of the problems that tends to occur in a design like this is clock skew. That is, CPU clock and CPU clock bar will be slightly out of phase because of this inverter. Sometimes you can get away with this, but in a prototype design, I always add in an extra flip-flop per signal, which is clocked by the high-speed raw clock signal. This means that all the clock signals coming out of this octal D-type flip-flop are in phase with each other, so to the rest of the board, they all appear to transition at exactly the same time. It just makes life so much easier. For example, the system's CPU clock and CPU clock bar should transition at exactly the same time. The next part of the circuit is the CPU itself. If we look at the block diagram, the address bus and data bus on the CPU are isolated from the address bus and data bus that the memory sees. And this is done to allow the CPU and the video system to have interleaved access to the main memory. All the signals directly connected to the CPU are prefixed with the rather imaginative label CPU. The non-maskable interrupt, wait, 
and bus rec signals all have pull-up resistors. We can see the CPU clock bus signal going in here. I haven't used an edge connector like the ZX Spectrum has. Instead, I've added this pin header. Here, we can see the CPU address signals coming out of the CPU, going to this pin header, and onto a pair of 748C245 tri-state octal buffers. I use a 2x18 header strip, so the machine can be directly connected to an Arduino Mega for debugging and expansion. CPU A0 through 7 connects directly to port C of the Arduino, and CPU A8 through 15 connects to port L. Although the 748C245s are bidirectional, here, they're hardwired to only go from left to right. The outputs are gated by CPU clock, which means they'll output to the memory address bus labelled MA when CPU clock's low. But when CPU clock's high, the output of these buffers will be high impedance, which means they're logically disconnected. Now, the CPU data bus is a little more complicated because of bidirectional. From the CPU, it goes directly to the pin header, but it has different pathways for writing to and reading from the memory data bus. The write pathway goes through a 748C245 onto the memory data bus, similar to the address bus. The main difference is that we use the CPU MREC and a modified version of the write signal to decide whether to drive the memory data bus. There's another level of complication here. I've used the latch version of the CPU WR signal. Now, if it were just the Z80 that could write to memory, I wouldn't need this. But I have this games loader board, and the Arduino has asynchronous control of the CPU write signal during a bus request. This flip-flop ensures that the CPU write signal from the Arduino won't finish halfway through a write cycle, potentially corrupting data. When designing machines like this, if you mess up the write, either the wrong data is stored, or the right data is stored with the wrong location, both of which could be a disaster. That's the right pathway. The trick to making this design work is this 74HC374 octal D-type flip-flop in the read pathway, which transfers data from the memory data bus to the CPU data bus. We use this to hide the video memory data from the CPU. It's clocked on the positive edge of CPU clock, which is also the negative edge of CPU clock bar, so it means the data is latched on these red lines. What happens is that when the CPU is performing a memory read, CPU data coming from the memory is latched and presented to the CPU when both CPU read and CPU MREC are both low. When CPU clock bar is low, the memory outputs video data, but the Z80 sees the data from the last CPU read instead of the video data that's on the memory data bus. Of all the features in this design, this was my biggest concern, but it worked like a charm. Running the CPU at 3.5 MHz means the entire cycle time is about 286 nanoseconds, so it's high for 143 nanoseconds and low for 143 nanoseconds. This means all the memory accesses need to occur in 143 nanoseconds. The static RAM I'm using is a 628128 128K by 8 static RAM, and it comes in 50, 70, and 80 nanoseconds parts. I happen to be using an 80 nanosecond part in this design, and it works fine. I only use 64k of the memory space, but I might expand it to be a 128k machine later, but I'm also kind of running out of board space for this iteration. Timing for the ROM is a bit tighter. I'm using a 27C4001, which is a 512 by 8 bit part, but I really only need 16k of this. The problem is that it's a 100 nanosecond part. Connecting the memory to the design is pretty straightforward. We connect the memory address bus to each chip, wired in parallel. We connect the memory data bus to each chip, again, wired in parallel. On top of that, we just need some extra logic to select between the two. Generally, only the CPU should access the system EEPROM. Chip-enabled bar is connected to CPU clock, which means it's asserted when the CPU has access to memory. For addresses from 0 to 3FFF hex, the CPU accesses the ROM, but for addresses above 4000 hex, it accesses the RAM. I've used CPU A14 and CPU A15 in these two OR gates to select the output from the ROM or the RAM while CPU clock's low. Because they settled before MA14 and MA15, this removes these two OR gates from the critical timing pathway. Same with CPU MREC and delayed write bar.
The ROM enables signal, which comes from the pin header, allows the Arduino to access all the RAM if it wants. The EEPROM is the slowest part, so let's look at our critical path, which starts with the switching of U7 and U14. Our 74HC245 enable time is typically 11 nanoseconds, but the worst case is 30 nanoseconds. The EEPROM itself takes 100 nanoseconds, and the 74HC374 receiving the data requires up to 12 nanoseconds of setup time. Let's see. We have a budget of 143 nanoseconds, 30 nanoseconds to switch the 245s, 100 nanoseconds for the EEPROM, then 12 nanoseconds setup time, so 142 nanoseconds in total. This is pretty close, but remember, this is the worst case. A typical case is more likely to be 11 nanoseconds plus 100 plus 5 nanoseconds, or 116 nanoseconds in total, so we should be good. The output enable signal is one OR gate delayed from CPU clock, so we should settle before our address is ready. For writing to the RAM, we're allowed a little more time before we assert mem write bar, so this gate, U18B, isn't really in the critical path. Next, we look at the raster generator. This circuit is set up as a finite state machine, with 65,536 states, requiring 16 state variables. The purpose of this circuit is to generate the memory addressing for displaying video. This was done by the Z80 itself on the ZX81, and it was offloaded to the ULA in the spectrum. I'm using a larger EEPROM for this, the 27C322, which is 4 megabytes in capacity, arranged as 2 meg by 16 bits. I only use 64K of this 2 meg address space, but the excess capacity lets me have different configurations for different raw clock oscillators if I want. I've carved up the 64K state space to look like this, where addresses in the lower 16K mean the raster is in the active portion of the display, between 16K and 48K, it's in the border area, and the top 16K is for sync signals and blanking. At any given memory address in the EEPROM, the data stored is just the address of the next 8 pixels to be displayed. Because of this, it forms a kind of circular linked list. Now, the bottom 8 bits of the state machine always matches the bottom 8 bits of both the pixel address and the attribute address. This means the lower 8 bits can just be connected directly up to the memory address bus, and that's good. The only thing we need to do is enable the output of the octal D-type flip-flop storing the data when CPU clock bars low. The upper 8 bits are a bit more complicated. The state feeds directly back into the EEPROM. The way I've designed the finite state machine, the state address will be the same for both the pixel data and the attribute data for any given 8 pixels. We do need two memory reads per 8 pixels, one for the raw data and one for the attribute, but conveniently, the CPU clock is called the data clock, so that means we need to do exactly one memory read per CPU clock. The way we manage the difference in the memory mapping for the pixel data and the attribute data is with this pair of 74HC257 2 to 1 multiplexers. These have tri state outputs, so again, we use CPU clock bar to control when these signals drive the memory address bus. When the half CPU clock bar signals low, we select a pixel address, which is between 4000 and 57FF hex. When the half CPU clock bar signals high, we perform an attribute read, which will be the second by the pair and is in a range confined to 5800 to 5AFF hex. Because the finite state machine address is the same for the pixel and the attribute read, we only need to update the video state every other CPU clock, which is why the state machine is clocked by half CPU clock bar instead of CPU clock bar. This is the gross structure of the design, and I think I'll stop here for this video. I'll save the remaining logic for the next video. Remember, the schematic and code for programming the Rust generator are available on GitHub.